Welcome to the Strategy and Leadership Podcast, the podcast that brings you practical advice, lessons, and stories from senior leaders and thought leaders from around the world. The Strategy and Leadership Podcast is brought to you by SME Strategy, working with organizations around the world to create and implement their strategic plans. To learn more, visit smestrategy.net. And now, your host, Anthony Taylor. Hey there, folks. Welcome to today's episode of the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. My guest today, calling from California, is Lisa Curtis, the founder and CEO of Cooley Cooley Foods. Lisa, how's it going today? I'm great. Thanks for having me on the show. Awesome. I'm excited to share your story. Um, why don't you tell our listeners a little bit of what you've done, how you got to where you are, and then I'll get you into some questions. Yeah. So I started my company, Cooley Cooley Foods. 10 years ago, if you can believe it, I, after working with this amazing superfood called Moringa in the Peace Corps, um, and short backstory, I was placed in this small village in Niger, West Africa, no electricity, no running water, not a lot of healthy food, found myself feeling just really tired off a diet of mostly rice. Um, I'm a vegetarian, so I wasn't eating meat and wasn't didn't didn't quite know what to eat, so it was, it was not eating uh, very well. And asked some women in the health center while I was working, you know, what can I eat that will give me more energy, that will give me the nutrition I need. And they pulled these moringa leaves off a tree and mixed them into these this popular snack called kuli kuli. Um, so I was I never heard of moringa, never thought to eat tree leaves, but I trusted these women. And was like, okay, if you say this will make me feel better, like. I'll eat it. I'll, I'll try anything. Um, and so I started eating it and it had the most profound impact on my body than anything I've tried. It just, you know, the Moringa is packed with protein, calcium, iron, vitamins. Um, so on the nutritional side, it's like an incredible nutritional powerhouse, more nutritious than kale. And then it's also used medicinally all over the world. So it has incredible anti-inflammatory properties. Um, a lot of folks, particularly in South Central America, use it for diabetes and weight management. Um, you find it, you know, it's recommended in Ayurvedic medicine. It's the national vegetable of the Philippines. So it's, it's just a really cool plant. And I was like, why is it that I'd never heard of this plant? Why is it that I, you know, the time couldn't find it in the U.S.? Um, but my first question was like to these farmers, you know, what can I do to help you all grow more and use more of it here in Niger? Um, and the thing that they said to me is, you know, we're not going to grow a crop that we can't sell. So why don't you help us sell it? Um, and then we'll grow more, we'll use more, and we'll all benefit. I had no idea what I was signing up for. I never started a food company before. I never even worked at a food company before, but I was like, sure, no problem. I'll help you. Thinking this would be, you know, a short term project. <laughs> um, a decade later, I'm still doing it. So Cooley Cooley sells Moringa and other superfood products, all sustainably sourced directly from small farmers. We then sell them in the form of powders and gummies. You can find us in 11,000 stores across the U.S. So we're everywhere from Whole Foods to Walmart to, you know, Sprouts, many other natural food stores in between. Awesome. And how big has the company grown from somebody who's eating uh, trees off a plant? And now how many employees do you have across uh, the U.S. or the world? Yeah. So we have a lot of folks who are not full-time employees. We're still um, like in the U.S., about 10 folks, um, but internationally, you know, we have about 3,000 farmers who we're directly working with and supporting. Um, and then we have all of our manufacturing partners, which is, you know, another couple hundred folks as well. That's awesome. I mean, to be able to supply that many stores is is pretty impressive and and significant and impactful. And what I think is just really cool is the work that you're doing is not just supporting call it your own local supply chain, because it's really easy to look about it like that. And I like how you reframed it to say, hey, there's like 3000 farmers and their families and their communities that are supported through this work. And, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to chat. So, um, so, you know, take me back, you know, 10 years ago, you said, oh, sure, I'll totally help you sell stuff. And now you're in all of these, you know, significant uh, stores across the US, you know, what was like that that journey? And I guess to ask you a more specific question is, 
you know, what was the leap, that first leap from, hey, I'm going to do this short term project to, okay, I'm going to find a co-founder or what have you, and then start this business? Yeah, so it was actually kind of an interesting leap. It involved a terrorist attack um, in the sense that I was initially planning to just, you know, work in Niger, you know, serve my full Peace Corps service in Niger, helping them grow more Moringa. And then we were just going to sell it like in a local city. Um, and then there was a terrorist attack in Niger and they evacuated the entire Peace Corps home early. So I was back living at my parents' house, pretty unhappy about it, like didn't have a job. You know, this had been my my plan for, you know, two and a half years. Um, and so I said, okay, well, you know, maybe I can't help them sell it locally, but maybe I can help them sell it in the U.S. Um, but I also, coming back from Peace Corps, you know, was making $20 a month, so had very little savings. Um, so I got a day job at a tech startup and nights and weekends was trying to put together a business plan, trying to figure out what that would look like and then pulled in, you know, one of my childhood best friends who had a lot of experience in startups and then another childhood best friend who had a lot of experience in food and new product development. Um, and we started, we started meeting nights and, and weekends and figuring out, okay, how do we get this idea off the ground? Excellent. And then how did it go from there? You guys just kept selling and growing. And I guess what are some of those like lessons that you learned along the way of 20 bucks a month? To yeah, numbers? yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, I think we were really big on like, let's try, like, let's, let's, let's do baby steps. Like, I, th I think a lot of times, if you have this really big, you know, world changing idea, it's hard to understand, okay, what's the first step? And then after that, what's the next step? And how do we get these little tiny steps that eventually add up to this vision that we want to create? Um, so for us, it was, will people buy Moringa? And if so, like, why? Uh, and so we, we first needed to figure out how do we just import a small amount of Moringa from West Africa? Um, and then let's test it at farmer's markets and let's make it a bunch of different products and see what people will buy. So we actually tried to make that original coolie coolie snack that I had first um, envisioned and didn't quite work, but the name stayed. Um, and we ended up uh, launching with a, a Moringa bar um, that we then tested out messaging, got a lot of really interesting insights about what people what resonated and what didn't resonate you know me being this bleeding heart peace corps volunteer i was like oh everyone will care that it's sourced from women farmers it's helping to plant trees it's like good for the world and um you would have these people who would come up and like be like oh peace corps oh yeah my uncle did peace corps and like talk to me for 20 minutes and then walk away and not buy anything because you know i wasn't i wasn't pitching the product i was pitching this this story and this nonprofit vision and then we switched and we we're like, okay, let's talk about this is more nutritious than kale. You're getting a full cup of leafy greens in every bar, like, you know, simple ingredients. So give you energy. And, and then we started to see the sales move. So it was really valuable to have, you know, a very small budget um, just to like test and learn and test and learn. And we changed up things every farmer's market, which now I, I'm sort of envious. You know, now we're at a scale where, we produce like a hundred thousand units at a time, so it's it's really hard for us to like go really small and and test and learn and iterate in the same way. So that that's one of my biggest pieces of advice to folks starting out is like everybody wants to be really big, but there's benefits of being small and make sure you maximize your like testing and learning while you're still small. Hmm. How do you uh, maintain that kind of tight culture within your team? Because obviously, you I mean, you may be able to sell more than I don't know what the market is, but obviously focusing on presumably quality and maintaining the integrity of the core product sounds like something that's important to you. Also making sure that you're able to deliver your mission sustainably. So what do those conversations look like, like inside your boardroom to help make sure people are focused on the right things? I mean, I think it's really first and foremost about hiring the right people. Um, so we're really focused on people who have, you know, have the relevant skill set, like have spent time working in logistics or operations or sales or whatever, 
but also really resonate with the mission. And that like part of the reason they want to work at Cooley Cooley specifically is because they don't want to just sell a product. They want to sell a product that helps to make the world a better place. Um, and so I think it's, you know, having people on our team and our, our partners be really all instilled with this is why we're here. This is why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and, and then I think it's about making sure that we set the guidelines of like, okay, you know, what, who, what type of suppliers will we source from? And like, what are, what types of suppliers won't we source from? And are we going to direct source every single ingredient? Well, no, because there's, you know, some ingredients like in our gummies, we have to use a small amount of cane sugar. Like it's not worth us getting involved in the cane sugar supply because it's not a lot we can do there as a small company, but it's worth us getting involved in the moringa supply and the baobab supply and hibiscus and, you know, different ingredients where we actually can make a true impact on the ground. Hmm. Um, and so that's kind of, in my mind, it's really about prioritization and making, setting clear expectations. And Excellent. Boundaries. Yeah, no, I love that you guys are able to basically look at making decisions through that mission lens to make sure that you're like authentic to the product, but all again, like making sure that you're supporting the people. Um, so if we look at like your journey as a CEO, like how's that been? Has it been fun? Has it been enjoyable? Has it been stressful? Uh, I you mean, know, what all are some of the above, right? Yeah. Like I think that's, to me, the thing that is most fun and exciting about being a CEO is there's no cutty, cookie cutter day. Every day is different. Like who knows what's going to come up and maybe there's some fire, you know, whether figurative or we've even had literal fires in our supply chain um, and, and different things that the world will toss at us that I have to kind of like figure out and, and solve um, and feel you know, very excited to have a, a really amazing team that we can problem solve together on these things. Hmm. Do you have like a leadership ethos that guides you through these things or like a mantra that supports you? Not like a mantra, but just how do you view leadership? How do you view your role and position as a CEO? Also recognizing that it's iterative, evolving, continuously changing. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a big believer in the sort of like visionary leadership. I'm I think of it as like, let's get the right people on the boat. Let's make sure we're all rowing in the same direction. We all know where we're headed. And let's make sure that we've got enough fuel or like wind in the sails to get us there. And and so, you know, wind in the sails for me means like making sure we've got the right funders behind us, be that both investors and debt, um, making sure we, you know, we've we've got all the things we need to like push us forward. Um, how did that come to play when it comes to gathering these 3000 farmers? Like I could imagine, you know, for, uh, I'll say white girl from California to come into West Africa and say, Hey, we're going to sell your product. That's been part of your culture and heritage for a long time. And then, you know, how did you build their trust? What's it like building and maintaining that network? Is that the work you do? Is that somebody else on your team? And because it's obviously a core part of the work that you do. Yeah, no, it's a good, it's a great question. And I think, you know, there is definitely a big part of what we think about is what we call Jedi justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And like, how do we really partner as in a win-win way with our suppliers? And so, you know, first of all, it's, it's not us going in anywhere. Um, we always work with folks who reach out to us. So generally that's a matter of like, Sometimes people will, you know, literally email our <laughs> customer service and say, I'm growing Moringa and I want to chat and we'll we'll talk to them. Sometimes it's like we've worked with the Clinton Foundation and USAID and, you know, other organizations in the nonprofit and development space. And they've said, here's this really cool Moringa project or, you know, Moringa Enterprise. You should talk to them. And then we talk to them from there. Um, but we see our skill set as understanding how to unlock access to the U.S. market. Um, mm -hmm. And we really rely on our supplier partners to do what I think of as a really hard part. Like farming is not easy. <laughs> um, growing and processing the highest quality Moringa. Um, and we do, you know, send QA people to visit our farms. We do really support on making sure that we're hitting those quality requirements. 
Hmm. That's awesome. Um, just as kind of a final question, how it says, you know, the justice, equity, diversity, inclusion, equity, inclusion, Jedi, yeah. on your website, and you obviously brought it up right now. Uh, and it's, you know, kind of a, I don't want to call it a hot topic, but a lot of people are discussing it and looking yeah. at incorporating it. It sounds like it's part of your core values. It's obviously attached to your mission. Um, but how, what would you recommend to uh, our leaders, our listeners, who might be exploring or, I you not know, to use the word interested, call it committed to incorporating justice, equity, diversity, equity, inclusion, that's equity twice, because um, it's so important. Uh, but what do you recommend steps for them to take to implement it successfully and with authenticity and truth? Yeah, I think one of the things we did a few years ago um, was really make sure that we weren't just thinking about our supply chain, but we're also thinking about our internal team and what the makeup of that team looks like and also the ways that we're including, you know, justice, equity, inclusion, and belonging, um, Mm -hmm. I think is also really key. And so we changed a lot of our hiring practices. I think often companies will just like, you know, throw out, these are all the qualifications I want, you know, and There's a lot of research that shows people who are, you know, generally white men will say like, oh, you know, I don't hit 100% of these qualifications, but I'm going to apply anyway. Um, Versus like women and people of color will often be like, oh, I can't apply. I don't I don't qualify. Um, And so making sure that we really only had on there like the things that we absolutely needed. And we also included Mm -hmm. a statement about like diversity is important to us. Um, and we do have, you know, 40% of our team identifies as, as non-white. Um, so we've we've got a fairly diverse team and it makes us so much stronger. It's like it, it you see it in sometimes the little things of like, oh, our head of operations is fluent in Spanish. And guess what? Most of the people who work in manufacturing at a lot of our co-manufacturers are their native language is Spanish. And so him being able to go onto the factory floor and like you know, talk to folks and like very quickly work stuff out is unbelievable. It's, it's, it's amazing to watch. Um, Similarly, the person who manages our logistics is Samoan, which is, you know, not something I'd really known, but there's like a huge number of Samoans in the the freight and trucking industry. And she like, you know, speaks that language, so to speak. Um, So I think there's like a lot of benefits to diversity and, and sometimes, benefits you don't even know until you have a more diverse team and you're like oh cool <laughs> that's awesome <laughs> that's awesome uh, it's funny i don't know if you've ever seen brooklyn 99 but there's an episode where the less qualified people or whatever weirdos get put into an escape room and they all use their like specific skills to help like escape and it's just you know to that point you, people talk about it where you gave two really practical examples of like the value of it. And of course, you know, yes, you could say, oh, that's self-serving. You hired them because they support your supply chain. But, you know, we could have mentioned literally thousands of different ways where they contribute to the social and and personal fabric of the business, which I mean, what I know of you is it probably goes without saying. And because it's a business podcast, you brought up business things, but, you know, just to show that it supports that. And I also really like that you really took into consideration the applicant's experience of applying such that you were able to like, you lowered the barrier, but not in a way that would compromise the company. You made it easier for people that you wanted to apply to apply, which supported, you know, you getting the candidates that you truly wanted ultimately, because then you're not reducing the field. In fact, you're increasing the field by making it easier. So I thought that was cool too. Thank you. Yeah. And I'm constantly learning. And I think we've we've gotten better as we've grown. Excellent. So my last question is, what are you taking on now? As a CEO, what is the area that you're either struggling with or that's in like your growth zone that you're really focused on developing over the next year or so? Yeah, it's a great question. I, there's three things that really come to mind. Um, I think top for many CEOs is, 
sales. I'm, you know, developing some pretty strong relationships with some of our key retailers like Whole Foods, Sprouts, Walmart, um, and having, you know, increasingly higher level conversations there about what they're looking for in their set and like how we can design products for their customers. And and that's just like a really exciting place to be. Um, I think relatedly innovation, you know, we're thinking a lot about like where, where is the white space and how do we build out this climate smart superfood platform? Like we've, you know, we're 60% of the U.S. market for Moringa. We're the big dog there (laughs) for sure. Um, But how do we do that for some other unique ingredients? How do we do that for some other really cool superfoods and and bring them to the U.S. not just as like a weird superfood nobody's ever heard of, but put them into blends, put them into gummies, make them really accessible to Americans so that more people can experience the benefits of these incredible superfoods and support small farmers. Um, And then three, I think, really excited to continue to uphold kind of our, our mission and our culture and be be that voice, um, both within our company and outside of our company, because I think I have a responsibility to make sure this is the best possible place to work for our team, that it's the best, we're the best possible partners to our suppliers, you know, great communicators to our investors. Um, and then also just within the general industry, like I, I think a lot about being a female founder, um, you know, being someone who's raised 11 million in venture capital. Um, unfortunately, as a female founder, that makes me somewhat of a unicorn. Um, and for many of our investors, you know, we're one of very small number of portfolio companies that are women led and run. Um, and so I feel like we need to over communicate. Um, and I feel even more pressure to, to make sure we continue to be successful. Yeah, I get that. Well, I, I appreciate you sharing that because running a business is challenging for anybody and everybody. And unfortunately, the societal challenges that are in place. Uh, but despite all of that, You've gone from a non-business background to building an incredible business that's gotten a lot of recognition, that's, of course, got funding, that's in a blue ocean where there's not a lot of, you know, you're creating a market, you're innovating, you're taking it all all at once, and you're doing it while maintaining your Jedi B uh, approach and supporting literally thousands of farmers across the world and doing something cool. So, uh Hats off to you. I'm not wearing a hat, but I would take it off if I was. But there we go. Um, but okay. awesome. Thanks. Uh, Thanks for having me. <laughs> oh, you're so welcome. It was my pleasure. So, Lisa, yeah, thank you for being here. Thanks for sharing. And I'm going to go, uh, hopefully, if it's in Canada, pick up some uh, some gummies soon. So I appreciate you being here, Lisa. Thank you. Oh. Folks, my guest today, Lisa Curtis, who is the founder and CEO of Cooley Cooley Foods. I think one of the cool things that I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs, I see a lot of different businesses, and it's tough when you're creating something that doesn't exist. It wasn't just a matter of just like, hey, we're going to sell this product that already exists. It's creating a new market. It's creating new distribution. It's creating all of those things, but maintaining the original mission. So as you take on whatever you're taking on today, whether it's a brand new enterprise, whether it's you're an employee in an organization or you're evolving and innovating to say, hey, how can you do it better to support the people and, and recognize that there's always ways to improve and ways you can learn. So I appreciate you watching and listening to the podcast as a means of doing that. I appreciate that I get to share with you. And again, once again, thank you, Lisa, for for joining me today. So uh, this has been the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. My name is Anthony Taylor. I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Strategy and Leadership Podcast. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single episode. And if you enjoyed today's episode, please consider giving us a review. We appreciate you listening and following along, and we hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. And as Anthony says, until next time.